I was interested in the slide about the micro futures. Okay. And it was a reason to take the storage with microbes. I was just wanting you to elaborate on that, the data storage component. For microbes. For microbes. So I, I would like to hear a bit more about that. But I'd, I'd also just like to mention that in the, 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 the tree of life that you had shown us, there are many elements that are described already. But even as part of that, there are a huge amount, there's huge amounts that is undescribed. Correct. So moving away from that, and then, you know, moving emphasis into the into another component, namely microbes. Um, what are your opinions on that? My, it's an excellent question. Um, I think my answer to that is not an either or proposition. Um, all biodiversity institutions for the past 300 years, no matter how old they are, for the past 300 years, have spent their resources and their energy on the visible um, biodiversity that is based on the notion of an individual. Individual insects, individual plants, individual other individual animals, and so forth. We have to continue doing that. Um, our knowledge of bird biodiversity and therefore patterns and processes of, say, bird, um, uh, biodiversity and, and, and ecology are much better than they are for uh, many groups of insects. And they can teach us a lot um, about sustainability at a certain level. At the same time, we still have to keep um, uh, increasing our knowledge of the biodiversity of those insects that we don't know, uh, say soil arthropods which are terrifically important for ecosystem uh, function. But that's still only half the biodiversity of the planet. Isn't it time we also turned our attention to the half of the biodiversity of the planet that we don't know anything about or know very little about and yet may be even more critical than anything we have, we have described so far? To quote a, a a former Secretary of Defense that uh, I didn't like, but this is a quote, we don't know what we don't know when it comes to the whole microbial sphere and the whole viral sphere. And they may be, I like to say, that um, we are the marionettes and the, micros and the microbes are pulling the strings. Wonderly. Uh, you mentioned uh, the importance of uh, microbial diversity. Yes. And uh, the importance of microorganisms for, for the sustainable future. Yes. Uh, do you know which are the plans of involvement of uh, the microbial resource centers? or Because, for example, like in those big uh, by the first the big they are, they, they are outsider, outsiders. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the two largest microbial enterprises that I know of is the uh, Human Biome Project, which is sampling all of the, all, the entire biome within the human body. And what they have found, there was these two, three great publications in Nature on um, uh, that different parts of the human body had different species, quote, species, kinds of microbes. Uh, there were different microbes associated with the esophagus, different with your mouth, different with your, your intestines, different with your reproductive organs, and, and so forth. And that these microbes stay with you for a very long time, and are more, and the ones in your children are different than the ones in other people's children. So they may even be passed on. And they're, they're now being used as experimental cures for um, some awful uh, intestinal diseases where the, your gut biota of your closest relative is given to you, say, after you've had antibiotics and it's cleaned you out. And, and that ends up curing, I forget what the disease is called. 
Um, it's an intestinal disease, uh, a bad one. I'm sorry? CEDA is a very common one for hospitalized babies. Right, right. So, um, but, but that's human uh, microbial diversity. The other one is called the Earth Biome Project, and that's in Chicago at a former um, a national lab, the Argonne National Laboratory. And you can send them any single sample, and they will uh, do the microbial detection. It'll be a whole bunch of metagenomic sequences, and they'll send them back to you. Yeah, but see, those are you know, scientific initiatives. Yes. U.S.-based. Those are both U.S.-based. I don't, I don't know about any others on the globe. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't exist. It's yeah. just that it's just my, my personal knowledge is not that yeah, great. But somehow, I think, in order to address this issue of uh, microbial diversity, yes. I think we need uh, to, to, to take a look at uh, the, the institutional base. Absolutely. Because, so uh, I think uh, that's the, we, we are here uh, dis, dis, discussing why to erect the institutions. Yeah, yes. And, uh, yeah. and then you mentioned the importance of microbial diversity yes. for, the, for the sustainable earth. So I think uh, somehow we should look at which are the existing institutions right. and which are the existing efforts to, to build capacity of uh, microbial resource centers. Which is exactly the advice that it, um, the science committee of GBIF has given to GBIF that microbes should be their next target um, data type, microbial metagenomics and uh, they should form partnerships with the microbial institutions around the globe that are already doing this, because GBIF can't do it on its own. They need to form the partnerships with those organizations to do it and ramp it up to a global level. And I think every single biodiversity informatics institution should get in on get that game, just like they're in on plants, just like they're in on animals. One more brief question. Yeah. <laughs> brief one, just say. Which is I really enjoyed the, the, the talk, you know, not you. the view that you had on informatics and everything. Um, the one thing that I want to ask you, I mean, I totally agree about the access to information and information integration, but on top of that, you, you actually work with power that was always ingrained in access to information. Um, you know, up to now, people that had access to information were usually better empowered to do lots of things. Now that scenario is changing completely because of connectivity. So everybody now has access to information and the right. mechanism to integrate it and so on, you know, is, is, is distributed. Well, it was always right. very... Now your little model didn't really touch on distribution and interpretation and access. Um, the one that you had where you describe up to the level where you've got the description basically, uh, where you had the data. Uh, data yeah. model analytics yeah. narrative, yeah. yeah. That's, That's the, the framework the, of, yeah. yeah. But there's actually what I'm asking is, um, I see a, you know, whether you agree that there might be another level which is distribution and access of that description. Um, what did you call it? You basically had the, your data model, um, the thing. Was that I wrote, wrote it down somewhere? But were you uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, um, when I say data and description, yeah. what what is of course implicit is that data that is that that data is available to everybody yeah, yes. to do the modeling, the analytics, and the, the narrative. Modeling, analytic, and, yeah, yeah, you see, and, and all of those so, labels should also be available after right. modeling, after. Into, you know, yes. And it is actually, um, but that changes the, the domain of role players that actually interact with this kind of information. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And, and there can and there can be similar collaborators in in the modeling aspect. Yes. For example, our researchers at the Biodiversity Institute at KU collaborate with others in the modeling and and enhance their modeling ag algorithms. Same thing with the analytics, and certainly in the visualization of the narratives and, no, and, and the results. You know, that's the narratives that's actually also what I was talking about, because there is, in a sense, another layer, which is what we were talking about all along, 
I mean, the Biodiversity Institute, um, at this stage, the model that we have is going from scientific knowledge to policy. Right. Which is one narrative. At That's extreme. right. That's right. But it's possible that there are lots of other stakeholders that might start to influence this kind of model and also change policy. Right. You know, so if you get other communities participating in this kind of narrative, you Absolutely. change the game. Absolutely. So after you come for, down from data to, say, modeling and analytics, what do you want to model and what do you want to analyze for what purpose and yeah. there you're going to get many different stakeholders asking for many different kinds of narratives yeah. and that's terrific okay, right. and and the data should be good enough so to serve is, all of those purposes yeah. and should be open enough, open enough. to so right. many researchers that all of those demands can be met so in this sense, GBIF is in a terrific success story in making the biodiversity data available to, to the world uh, of researchers and teachers and, and policymakers to demand the different narratives that they are looking for to inform their policy. Okay, right. no, okay, we not like the this. downside of that, <laughs> yeah. and we're going to talk about that on Friday, is the data that they serve has to be good enough yes. for that. And we'll talk about that on Friday. Are, of course, mechanisms now to manage that as well. But yes, okay. yes. <laughs>